If you've ever written a class in Python and thought, God, I wish I could just not have to deal with this boilerplate anymore, then this video is just for you. And that's exactly what data classes let you do. You create a class with its attributes and it creates the initializer, the string representation and all that for you. If you've ever used something like Atras or Pedantic in the past, then this will look very similar to you. And that's because uh, data classes are actually designed based on Atras. They are a simplified version though, so they might not be quite as fully featured as you might like. So have a look and see what you think. In this video, I will show off what you can do with data classes, how they're designed to be used, and I'll also show off a really cool extra functionality that Atras doesn't have. Of course, if you find this video helpful at any point, then consider leaving a like to let me know, and maybe subscribe if you want to see more videos like it. If you want to see future videos before anyone else, then consider becoming a member using the join button below. But with all that out of the way, let's take a look at arguably one of the most useful things in Python. Before we start, I just want to say that VS Code is being a bit weird today. It's flickering a little bit, and I don't really know why. Um, so sorry about that. It's not too bad, but I did want to mention it because I think it is probably obvious. Uh, but to actually use data classes, we just need to do from data classes, import data class, not default factory, data class, and then fields. And we'll be talking about what these do in time. Uh, and then for our specific example, I want to do a bit of a setup. So do from enum, uh, import enum and an auto. And then I want to do a gender enum which has male auto, female auto, and then we'll go the uh, we'll go the Google route and say user specified, uh, if I could spell it, there we go, which is auto. And that just helps me explain uh, something a little bit better. To actually define a data class, you define a normal class, but as you can see from the AI, you use a data class decorator. And you could define it like that, or you can define it as a parenthesized one if you want, it doesn't matter. There are options you can pass to the decorator, but we'll talk about those in a second. Uh, so either one is fine. I'm going to do it with because I actually prefer the look of that. And I'm going to be doing my favorite example, which is a profile. And we're just going to have name, which is a type string, age, which is a type int, gender of type gender. And then we're going to have jobs of type list string. And then it is actually going to spoil a little bit here. Uh, but if we just go to this first one for a second, uh, well, these first two, really. So you define on the top level as a class attribute, uh, your attributes, and then you have to define their type. So type hints are mandatory in data classes. And this will create an adunder init function with these arguments to the constructor. And this is a theme of what data classes do. They auto generate pieces of code for you. So you don't have to deal with the uh, the the boilerplate yourself. So if I were to do this using just a normal class, I'll do class profile like that, and then I would do a dunder in it, and then I would have to do like name, string, age, int, gender, etc., etc. So I have to do like that, and then I would have to do self dot name equals name, self dot age equals age, etc., etc. So this just removes the need to do that. One other thing you get with data classes is default factories. So these are particularly useful for lists, um, especially in like tuples and dictionaries and stuff like that. And this helps you avoid the uh, the immutable values as default trap that you can fall into. So in Python, if you were to define, oh, we'll just do a function. If you were to define a function that took say a list and its default was a an empty list, this is actually not something you wanna do because this is created in memory and then assigned to LST. And then if you were to use dot append on this, for example, the default would actually change, uh, which is not ideal. It can lead to unexpected behavior. Data classes have a way around that where you can use the default factory equals list. And now uh, to create the default, it will call this list function, which is actually really nice. So that just provides a good way of doing that. You can still do just normal defaults. So for the gender example, we could do gender.user specified as the default. And now this would say, I don't know why that's complaining. Auto has, that's weird. It wasn't complaining earlier. Oh, I haven't set this as an enum. That'd be why. <laughs> uh, so if I set that as an enum, there you go. It's not complaining anymore. That was a big flicker there. Uh, but yeah, you could just set a normal default like that. You can also set a default here if you really wanted to. And then to create a data class, uh, if we just come down here and do if name equals main, uh, we could do profile uh, equals 
profile and then my name which is ethan and my age which is 26 now uh and then we can print p and one of the other things or print profile sorry one of the other things that data classes does is it auto generates that was a lot it auto generates a uh a string representation for you so it does it based on all of the different fields within uh, the data class. So we have name, age, gender, and, and jobs defined here. So we have name, age, gender, and jobs defined in the output. We can change this behavior, but we'll talk about that in a second because I do want to talk first about the options that you can pass into data classes. So there are a number of things you can do. Uh, so init is whether or not you create the dunder init. Uh, repper is whether or not you create the dunder repper. EQ is whether a dunder EQ is created. So if I were to do, say, another one of these and say profile one and profile two, uh, we can now check if profile one equals profile two and it will know what to do. And what it does by default is it checks, okay, does profile one dot name equal profile two dot name? Yes. Does profile one dot age equal profile two dot age? Yes. And then it, it goes through. And if all four match, uh, then it will it will uh, return true. If I were to change this to 25, we'll see that it returns false. So that's what the EQ does. The order is very similar, but it does the Dunder LT, Dunder GT, and I think LT and GT as well. So you'll be able to do things like profile one less than profile two. If that was something that worked for you, that's false by default because in a number of situations, you're not going to want that. And you probably won't ever want that as a complete thing because the data class decorator sets this for all of the fields. You can set this for fields individually and we'll talk about that in a bit. Unsafe hash is related to the data class's hashing ability. So the data class will create a hash automatically or uh, will create a Dunder hash method automatically if it's safe to do so in the data class. So I think think it would be safe to do so here so we could do hash uh, profile one and then we'll see if it does or not no it hasn't so it's actually detected i wonder if it's the the enum no what else can it not do does it do that as well oh huh, that's why i don't know should do the hash by default okay so quick check of the documentation it will only do it if everything is immutable within the uh, within the data class. So we can change age and we can change name. I think if you were to set it to, let's see, there's a frozen one as well, isn't there? Yeah, so if you were to set frozen equals true, which does actually make the data class immutable. It means you can't change everything once it's been created. I believe it will do this now. Yeah, so it actually does try it now, but it can't do a list. So we can just undo this for now. There you go, it can do a hash. Uh, unsafe hash, what that does it was, is it will try and create one even if um, things are mutable. So sometimes it might work, but the hash could potentially change. And it's not recommended, but it, it will let you do that uh, if you want to. Uh, frozen, we just demonstrated it will make everything um, completely mutable. So for example, you wouldn't be able to change profile one dot name equals like John or something. Uh, and we'll actually get a type error saying that, saying it's read only, but we'll also get a runtime error saying that we can't assign it to name. Uh, you then have match args, which is more objects generally rather than data classes specifically, so I'll leave that one alone. Uh, KW only means that arguments will only be able to be, be, uh, be provided as keyword arguments. So if we set that one, keyword only equals true. We'll now get errors down here saying that it needs to be, yeah, there's too many positional arguments. So we can then do name equals and then age equals, and it'd be fine with that. Uh, and then the final few slots, which will create a Dunder slots attribute on the data class and a weak ref slot, which is to do with weak references. Um, and most of those things you can do in a field as well. So if you go to the jobs down here, we see that most of these things are here. So init on a field means that um, 
oh, sorry, if init is false on a field, it won't be included in the initializer, but others will. Same in repr. So if you didn't want, say, the, the jobs to be included in the string representation, you could set this to for false. And if I were to print profile one now, then jobs wouldn't appear in the string representation. Uh, you then have hash. So whether or not you want this to be included in the hash or not. So if the data class was uh, frozen, we can then set this to hash equals false. And now the unhashable list type won't be included in the hash for profile one here. And it will come out with, um, well, it will come up with a different hash every time, actually. That's supposed to do that? I'm not sure. Uh, I'm, I don't pretend I understand the hashing logic in, uh, in Python, but that's how that works. You then have compare, which, if true, means that that field would be included in equality and uh, comparison methods, so ordering methods like GT, EQ, LT, et cetera, et cetera. Metadata, which... I don't really understand the purpose of, to be completely honest, it's just some random metadata on the field. If anyone does know what that's used for, then do let me know. I can't really figure out a use just looking at the docs. And you have KW only, which means that this particular field will be keyword only. So if you set keyword only equals true, and then if we try and do, if we set the gender equals like male, for example, and then if we, well, if we were to get rid of that and then we got rid of this, you'll see that we end up in an error with too many positional arguments again. And we could set jobs equals here because it's it's keyword only. Uh, and that's what you can do with a field. Of course, you can set the default and default factory uh, as well. I think default is something you can do in a, in a different signature, but of course you can just define it like this. Uh, the other way that you can define all keyword only arguments beyond a certain point so if I get rid of this, if I had to get rid of all these actually, is to use the, uh, the KW only, I guess, constant. Uh, and then if we set it here, set underscore and then set that as a type of keyword only, then now gender and jobs must be provided as keyword arguments. So if we were to set this, then it'd be fine. And that means that we don't have to provide a field for each and every one if we don't want to. Some people really don't like this syntax. I do prefer it to needlessly having to define field every single time, but some people won't. So that's entirely by choice. Uh, some of these things are only available in certain Python versions. So slots is 3.10, for example. I think this keyword only thing was either 3.10 or 3.11. So if you are using data classes in an old version of Python that do make sure uh, that what you want to do is actually included in the version that you're trying to use. So that was a very rapid rundown of more or less everything that is included in data classes. There are a good number of things in here. Uh, other alternatives that you might like are the Atras module uh, or the Atras package, which is a bit more fully featured and is backwards compatible, I think all the way down to 3.6. I've always tended not to get along with that very well but that's an option if you want it. The other option is also pedantic, which is a similar thing, uh, but it's just much more feature filled. I've already made a video on pedantic if you want to look at that as well. Before we finish up, there is one more thing that I want to show with data classes, which is actually something that Atras doesn't have, and that is init vars and post initialization. So if we create a file called post init.py, and I'm going to use a very minified real world example of this. So we're going to do from data classes, import uh, data class, and then we want init var as well. <clears throat> then we want to do class responder, which is the name of the class in the real world example. This is basically just uh, something that could respond to a query in an abstracted format. Uh, we are only going to care about a few things though, and that is the cache TTL which was a field, oh, we do actually want to import field then, there we go, with a default of 300 and it had a repr of, of false. And this cache TTL stands for cache time to live. So there was a few cache arguments, a few caching support uh, connected to a Redis cache and it used this argument to tell uh, Redis how long the cache entry should last. And by default that was 300, so five minutes. However, if the cache 
time to live was set to zero, it would say uh, that the cache was disabled. So there was a property uh, elsewhere. It was like cache, disable, self, and then that returned a bool. And then if the cache detail equals zero, the cache was disabled. This is not the easiest thing to communicate to users, uh, especially at a glance. It's it's just not obvious that cache TTL would be zero. When you think about it, logically that does make sense. But if you're looking for a way to disable the cache explicitly, you might not think to do this. And this is where you might come up with something like a disable cache argument, which is say false. Uh, and that would actually need to be a bool. And actually looking at it, uh, this would need to be type hinted to an int. There you go. So now you have this disable cache, which is a lot clearer to the user. But then if disable cache is true and you set it down here in this property, but then the cache time to live was still 300, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But if you set the cache GTL to 100, but the disable cache was false, this would still disable the cache even though this was false by default. And that doesn't make an awful lot of sense either. So you end up having to synchronize these two arguments and it all gets very complicated. However, with init vars, this becomes a lot simpler because what you can do is you can set uh, this as an init var and now the disable cache is no longer an attribute of the instance. When you create the responder, it won't have a disable cache attribute to it. It's just not a thing on it. You can actually uh, come down here. We say r equals responder. If we were to print r dot, you see we can uh, have cache disabled and cache DTL. It's not even there. So with that in mind, you might be thinking, what does this do? Well, it is provided as an argument to def dunder post in it. We can do disable cache, and this is a ball like this. Return none. And this post in it doesn't have to have any init vars to be used. It can just be post in itself, and then um, you could just use it. But this is called after the dunder in it and allows you to have um, or run any extra operations you want to run without having to create a whole custom init to do it. So this is basically just a way of bypassing having to create a custom init. And what we can do in this situation is if we've disabled the cache, we can set the cache TTL to zero. And now this is like a shortcut. So you can pass whatever you want to the cache TTL, but if you pass disable cache equals true, it will override this value to zero. So now you only have one value um, that determines the cache state, and it's now in a state that makes sense. So if we were to do this, just say disable cache equals true, uh, and you'll remember that the cache GTL is uh, uh, 300 by default, if we were to print that and then print that, uh, we would get zero and true, because this is now overridden that value. And it doesn't matter what you pass the cache TTL because this is always run after it. And disable cache works as expected and we only have one argument tracking the state, which is a lot easier to maintain. Let me know in the comments what you plan to use data classes for now that you know about them. And I know there was a lot of information in a very short space of time. I wanted to cover as much as I could with data classes because they're really cool. Uh, but if you need any, if you have any questions or need any further clarifications, do let me know in the comments below. The code I've used in this video will also be in the GitHub repository. Uh, below as well as all the other code from all the other Python is awesome videos. If you want to see new videos before anyone else then you can become a member using the join button below to get early access and if you want to see all the other videos I've done on Python in the past then you can check out the Python is awesome playlist in the cards on the end screen but I'll see you in the next one for whatever we do next.